reading from the book of Joshua. The Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know I am with you, as I was with Moses. Now command the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant to come to a halt in the Jordan when you reach the edge of the waters. So Joshua said to the children of Israel, Come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. This is how you will know that there is a living God in your midst, who at your approach will dispossess the Canaanites. The Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of the whole earth will precede you into the Jordan. When the soles of his feet are the priest carrying the Ark of the Lord, the Lord of the whole earth touch the water of the Jordan, it will cease to flow. For the water flowing down from upstream will halt in a solid bank. The people struck their tents to the cross the Jordan, with the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant ahead of them. No sooner had these priestly barriers of the Ark waded into the waters at the edge of the Jordan, which overflows all its banks, during the entire season of the harvest. Then the waters flowing from upstream halted, backing up in a solid mass for a very great distance indeed. For Adam, a city in the direction of Zarethan, while those flowing downstream toward the salt sea of Arabah disappeared entirely. Thus the people crossed over opposite Jericho, while all Israel crossed over on dry ground. The priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord remained motionless on dry ground in the bed of the Jordan until the whole nation had completed the passage. Verbum Domini. Alleluia. When Israel came forth from Egypt, the house of Jacob from a people alien tongue, Judah became his sanctuary, Israel his domain. The sea beheld and fled, Jordan turned back, the mountains skipped like rams, the hills like the lambs of the flock. Why is it, O sea, that you flee? O Jordan, that you turn back? You mountains that you skip like rams, you hills like the lambs of the flock. Lexio Sancti Evangelii secundo Matteo. Peter approached Jesus and said, and asked him, Lord, if my brother sins against me, how often must I forgive him? as many as seven times? Jesus answered, I say to you, not seven times, but 77 times. That is why the kingdom of heaven may be likened to a king 
who decided to settle accounts with his servants. When he began the accounting, a debtor was brought before him who owed him a huge amount. Since he had no way of paying it back, his master ordered him to be sold along with his wife, his children, and all his property in payment of the debt. At that, the servant fell down, did him homage, and said, be patient with me, and I will pay you back in full. Moved with compassion, the master of that servant let him go and forgave him the loan. When that servant had left, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a much smaller amount. He seized him and started to choke him, demanding, pay back what you owe. Falling to his knees, his fellow servant begged him, be patient with me and I will pay you back but he refused. Instead, he had the fellow servant put in prison until he paid back the debt. Now when his fellow servants saw what had happened, they were deeply disturbed and went to their master and reported the whole affair. His master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you your entire debt because you begged me to. Should you not have had pity on your fellow servant, as I had pity on you? Then in anger, his master handed him over to the torturers until he should pay back the whole debt. So will my heavenly Father do to you, unless each of you forgives his brother from his heart. When Jesus finished these words, he left Galilee and went to the district of Judea across the Jordan. Verbum Domini. Lord, if my brother sins against me, how often must I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus answered him, I say to you, not seven times, but 77 times. Basically an infinite number of times. You can't quantify forgiveness. It's interesting that it begins out with this discourse, and it's Peter who approaches Jesus and asks him this question. Lord, if my brother sins against me, how often must I forgive him? Peter. Peter asked him. Now remember, fast forward a little bit. What does Peter do to Jesus? Denies him. denies him three times. And also Jesus gives Peter the opportunity to what? To repent three times. Jesus asks Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? So three times Jesus gives Peter the opportunity to say, I'm sorry. And three times wasn't enough, but it was really the three times that Peter denied Jesus that Jesus gave him the opportunity to repent. So forgiveness is something, especially in terms of the Lord and how he has forgiven us. When we pray the Our Father, we pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. Forgive us our trespasses. Forgive us. We're asking forgiveness. So at the, the core of the Our Father is asking forgiveness. But how? As we forgive those. 
who have trespassed against us. Jesus is asking us to forgive. And in this parable of the unforgiving servant, the debtor was brought before him who owed a large amount. And basically the amount that he owed really was to symbolize an infinite amount, an amount that could not possibly be paid back in one's lifetime. And remember, the king forgave the man. But the forgiven man, once he has another person come and owes a much smaller debt, he's unwilling to forgive. Why? Because he forgot the forgiveness that had been shown him. He forgot the mercy that had been shown him. And maybe in our own lives, sometimes we have forget and we have forgotten the mercy that has been shown us by Almighty God. The forgiveness that God has showed each one of us in our lives. We could not have paid the debt ourselves. We could not bridge that infinite gap between Almighty God and us. Only Jesus is the one who bridges that gap. He's the one who pays the debt in full. He's the the one who ransoms us from not just any debt, money-wise, but he's the one who ransoms us from sin, from slavery to sin, from being shackled. If we remember the account of the Lord coming before the apostles in the upper room, and when the Lord gives the apostles, the authority to bind and loose, to forgive sins. Whoever sins you forgive, they are forgiven them. And whoever sins you retain are retained. When Jesus comes in, what does he show them? He shows them the wounds on his hands and side. Now, He could have chosen to take away those wounds. We think about it all, all, probably all the other wounds, the the wounds of the scourging, the, the, the wounds that he accumulated during his passion were not there, it seems to be, but the wounds on his hands his feet, and his side. Why is this? Because he wanted his apostles to see the price of forgiveness. He wanted them always to have before them the price of forgiveness, the price of ransom that he had paid in his own precious wounds on his hands, his feet, and his side. The forgiveness that God shows toward us is infinite. Now how do we, weak as we are, and sometimes lacking in forgiveness, and sometimes we, we forget what God has done for us, the mercy that he has shown toward us, how do we remind ourselves how much God has done for us? First, we must humble ourselves. First, we must humble ourselves, not like this man who was forgiven 
much was forgiven great, an infinite amount, remember, an amount that cannot be paid back in one's lifetime. But to remember to humble ourselves and to realize how much we have been forgiven. And this is not just something that happens one time, but it happens over a course of one's lifetime. Where we, appre where we learn to appreciate how much we've been forgiven, how much the debt that was paid for our salvation in Jesus. And again, this requires humility. This requires a total self-abandonment to the Lord and not becoming self-righteous. Coming before the Lord in all sincerity and saying, Lord, have mercy on me, a poor sinner. Why do you think we begin the holy sacrifice of the Mass with the Confidior? Asking God to have mercy upon us. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. That's what the priest says after we say the Confidior. And then again, right after that, Kyrie eleison, have mercy, Lord have mercy. Christe eleison, Lord have mercy. It's this constant asking to have mercy. And then right before we receive Holy Communion, when the Eucharist is held up, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. So there's this constant need of asking forgiveness. It shouldn't ever go away before our eyes as Christians. We should always have before our mindset, our eyes, our souls, how much we have been forgiven. Just on the natural level, the temporal level, if we think about the people that have forgiven us in our life, our own parents, perhaps the transgressions that we have shown toward them, the disrespect that we have given toward them. It's amazing to think that if I think that how much my parents have forgiven me in my lifetime and that God forgives more than that, wow. That's, any forgiveness that we experience from one another on the temporal level, from our brothers, from our sisters, from our parents, from our co-workers, our employers, and the list can go on and on, that's only a little sliver compared to the forgiveness that Almighty God wants to give you and has given you if we choose to accept. We choose to accept his forgiveness. And remember to always have before us, before our mind's eye, how much we have been forgiven by Almighty God. This takes humility. Forgiveness doesn't always mean forgetfulness, does it? We can be forgiven and we can forgive people, but it doesn't mean that we forget perhaps pain doesn't mean that we forget and it doesn't mean that we don't experience within our own hearts perhaps anger doesn't mean that bitterness goes away that that all needs to be purified this side of heaven it's one thing that as priests I think we hear often 
And it's beautiful when we repent and are sorry and we ask forgiveness, but very often we have the memories of the past, the memories of being hurt, the memories of hurting other people. That still remains. But God grants his forgiveness to us. Now perhaps the Lord allows that to remain. You know, just think for a minute if, if, the, if the Lord would take away the memories. Just think for a minute if the Lord would take away the hurt, the pain, the resentment, and the ways that which we have hurt people in the past and not forgiven them, and so on and so forth. If the Lord would take that away, we would probably go through life thinking that we did it by ourselves. We would go through life without recollection that God is the one who saved us. If the Lord would take away the memories. If the Lord would take away the memories even of our sins that we have done. I think many of us would like that if just if our memories would be wiped clean like a a tape being rewound and used over again. Mother Angelica would talk about this in her live shows, how we wish we could, Lord, I wish I could take that back. I wish I could take back what I said. <laughs> I wish I didn't have that memory. But the reality is we have to live with our brokenness. We have to live with those times in life where we have been unforgiving. And this goes back to being humble, humbling ourselves and recognizing that God is the one who forgives and that we are to enter into his forgiveness and in some way, with his help, forgive others as he has forgiven us. We give thanks and praise.